Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and this is Grit TV. Circles of concern. Do ours include public workers? Today in our lead, the nation's John Nichols considers the president's pitch for unity in Tucson, while Grit TV labor correspondent Ed Otts warns us New Jersey may be coming apart. With New Jersey labor leader Fran Errett, that and more ahead on Grit TV. And if, as has been discussed in recent days, their death helps usher in more civility in our public discourse, let us remember it is not because a simple lack of civility caused this tragedy. It did not. But rather because only a more civil and honest public discourse can help us face up to the challenges of our nation in a way that would make them proud. More than 26,000 people attended that memorial Wednesday night remembering the victims of Saturday's shooting in Tucson. And the president's 33-minute address is gaining plaudits even from the right. A call for civil discourse and widened circles of concern a giving of thanks for, among others, public servants and first responders. What will it all mean or accomplish, actually? With us, John Nichols, Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine. John, welcome to the program. Welcome back. Good to be with you, Laura. I don't like to think about these things as performance tests for the president. It seems it's a bit bigger than that. But nonetheless, it was a performance test for the president. Um, in terms of leadership, what do you think? Oh, look, this, if we are honest with ourselves, and we should be honest, uh, it's always politics. Politics is always the game. And Barack Obama's had a pretty lousy year. Uh, things have not been going very well for him. And so here he was at a, situa at a moment where if he had blown it, if he had just given a, a, a good address but a forgettable one, I think people would have really, that would have been noted, that this guy, whatever he had in 2008 was done. Instead, he went up there and he reminded everybody, and I'm talking deep into moderate, semi-conservative Republicans, of why they thought he was special. Now, a lot of conversation broke out immediately afterwards between those who were sorry he hadn't talked about specifics and people who kind of thought he had. Take a look at this clip, where it is a much-played clip, where he's talking about the nine-year-old Christina Green Taylor. There's a suggestion that, in fact, he's talking about much more than just her. Take a look. Imagine. Imagine for a moment, here was a young girl who was just becoming aware of our democracy, just beginning to understand the obligations of citizenship, just starting to glimpse the fact that someday she, too, might play a part in shaping her nation's future. She had been elected to her student council. She saw public service as something exciting and hopeful. She was off to meet her congresswoman, someone she was sure was good and important and might be a role model. She saw all this through the eyes of a child, undimmed by the cynicism or vitriol that we adults all too often just take for granted. I want to live up to her expectations. I want our democracy to be as good as Christina imagined it. I want America to be as good as she imagined it. All of us, we should do everything we can do to make sure this country lives up to our children's expectations. Now, you have a young girl yourself. That was a lovely story about a young girl. Mm -hmm. Was it also the defense of government that people have been waiting Absolutely. for? Absolutely. I mean, how, how naive are we? How simplistic are we that we have to actually have it be said? No. The great speeches never say it. King didn't say, you know, oh, I'm here for civil rights and I'm particularly concerned about Selma. No, he talked about the mountaintop. You know, I mean, let's be clear. Candidates... Politicians, leaders who are at their best, who know how to communicate to us, do not touch our brain. They touch our heart. And it is in our heart that our attitudes are shifted. 
And that's what Obama was doing there. There's simply no question. Um, there are people, and I said in a piece I wrote about this, who will suggest that this was exploitive, taking the death of a child and using it so aggressively. But you see, this is the genius of this speech. Uh, he looked at the material he had. He had a child who had been elected to her city or student council. I mean, she was there for this precise moment to begin her obligation of citizenship. And, I mean, anybody who misses that, frankly, is trying to miss it. But, well, and we're in a moment where people say, yeah, but Democrats are always eluding Republicans in the right smash it between the eyes. We saw that, too, this week. Absolutely. There's simply no question that this was a great debate. A great debate played out on Wednesday the way debates should. Not with the uh, candidates or the politicians all prepared and taking two-minute questions and one-minute responses, but each of them asked to respond to a fundamental tragedy, something that had shaken the nation and the world. Barack Obama, the most prominent, the most electric figure, whether people like him or not, within the Democratic Party, and Sarah Palin, the most prominent, most electric figure within the Republican Party. They each made major statements. And I ask you, which of the two, the one screaming about a blood libel or the one talking about a child and her obligation of citizenship, which one caught America's heart? It was pretty obvious. And I think that, you know, I know it's, it seems crass to talk politics in such a moment. There's so much more going on, and I respect it all. But I do think that this was a pivotal point uh, in Barack Obama's presidency, and pr arguably in this dialogue about uh, what the Democrats stand for. If they stand for that obligation of citizenship, that's not a bad thing to be about. Well, there's the standing and there's the walking. And, yes. and I think Gail Collins made some great points in her uh, op-ed in the New York Times today where she talked about things that need to be done also. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she talked about the power of the NRA and how Democrats are themselves intimidated enough of the rifle association, the gun lobby, that even when they were in a majority, they never, for example, um, had a vote on Carolyn McCarthy's renewal of the uh, assault weapons ban. Well, it is striking to me that uh, the debate about what to do on guns is actually playing out in the Republican Party. Peter King, the very conservative uh, chair of the Homeland uh, Security Committee, has come up and said, you know, at least we should have some gun control to protect members of Congress. Uh, and some other uh, Republicans are saying, no, we should arm members of Congress. Uh, but this gets to the heart of the matter. The NRA has done a fantastic job of shutting down discourse in this country. This is a constitutional moment. Barack Obama was a constitutional law professor. He should use it. He should give a speech about the Second Amendment, what it means, what its intentions are, and how he views it. And then from there, uh, let's open up a great big national dialogue. I, I, I actually think it would benefit Obama. There are some Democrats who say it would be destructive, but that's where we get to the walk the walk part of this. So the dialogue has to precede the actual laws and action. Of Absolutely. The, the Democratic Party is a, is, I mean, you could say to the Democratic Party, uh, all members of the Congressional Caucus have to wear tie-dye t-shirts <laughs> and, and flash peace signs. They'd be more willing to do that than to get a bad NRA rating. It's really tragic. Finally, he used a phrase that caught my attention. Well, two. One was the circles of concern. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. The other was this idea of expanding our moral imagination. Mm -hmm. What do you think he meant by that? Our moral imagination is saying, you know, when you're thinking in your own, in, the, in your best moment, how do you imagine this country and this world as it should be? And if it's moral, well, of course, that might even bring in something like providing health care for poor people or uh, making sure that our banks are fair to those who are losing their homes. Moral imagination is a term with a lot of reach, and I'm glad Obama used it. I'm just going to hope that he actually fills in the blanks around it a little bit. So what's the next thing you're looking for in terms of next steps after all of this, for the president in particular? Look, I, I think we just talked about it a moment ago. I really do think that we need to have some practical responses to this, and I think it has to be a constitutional discussion. Many amendments were brought into play. The most one of the most important things of the Constitution is often forgotten, that right to peaceably assemble. How do we protect people when they interact with their member of Congress? I think a lot of discussion should go into that. John Nichols, thanks so much for joining us. Great Thank to you. have you. Coming up, a conversation on public workers. And to start us off, a clip from the latest short by Brave New Films, Stop the Lies, Wall Street versus Main Street. 
Tough notices will soon be in the mail for nearly 900 state workers. The news, hundreds of state workers will start to be laid off in waves. Starting. According to past estimates, up to 10,000 jobs. We are talking about thousands of layoffs. The mayor is playing hardball by putting more jobs on the chopping block. My name is LaShawn Wiggers. I'm from Southern California. I was a child care director uh, for the city of Los Angeles for about five years of a facility which had uh, 50 preschoolers and 50 school age children. I guess it was about February. All child care was brought into a meeting to let us know that there were possibly going to be layoffs. Within the city, there's 26 state licensed child care centers. What they did was they closed all but two. So 24 sites are now closed. The fact that they're not gonna be a part of my life every day and the fact that I'm not gonna have contact and to make sure that they're safe every day, that's, that's my main concern because I know some of the situation of the parents, they're not gonna be able to afford some of the child care centers that are out there. So for me, that's, that's tough. Thousands of more L.A. City workers could soon face layoffs. We're talking about librarians, child care workers. We're teaching the children of the future. And for us to have lost our jobs or for us to be have, have let, been laid off, it's like what we do is not important. Only banks are only executives are only people who are higher up who kind of look down on us they're the ones who still get to keep their jobs other states are watching what we do here will we turn back because the road is too hard or will we press on because the future is too important New Jersey is getting recognized for taking on the tough issues that other politicians have refused to touch. We, we are showing other states that sometimes to create real change, you've got to go all in, show a little Jersey attitude. Well, that was New Jersey's Governor Chris Christie delivering his State of the State Address Tuesday. In another week, it might have stayed in the headlines a little bit longer. Christie's national profile is rising, and what he's preaching is austerity, for some at least. In Tuesday's speech, he reaffirmed his intent to cut pensions and benefits and curtail arbitration rights, especially for public workers. Even as in Tucson, public workers and first responders were briefly hailed as heroes, Around the country, they're under attack. Today, we continue our look at this conversation with a look at New Jersey. With us, Grit TV labor correspondent Ed Ott, former executive director of the New York Central Labor Council, and Fran Errett, president of the union that represents turnpike workers in New York, in New Jersey. Welcome, both of you. Um, nice to be here. Christie is a kind of, well, somebody on 60 Minutes referred to New Jersey as the canary in the coal mine. He is the kind of test case for this taking on of the public workers, don't you think, Ed? You know, more often than not, the canary ends up sick. Uh, you know, look, the governor has inherited a state that some very bad decisions were made in the previous decade by another Republican governor in particular, which put tremendous pressure, budget pressure out there. Uh, the problem we have with him is that he wants to solve it completely on the back of the standards, the wages, the pensions of working people, and we're trying to find a fairer solution. But to be fair to him, this is not a New Jersey discussion. This is a national discussion, and there's an attempt of, to readjust public sector worker standards nationwide, uh, frankly, worldwide. Now, Christie, though, is getting attention friend because the story out there is he's managed to rein in deficits, pull down unemployment from 10 percent to on just over 9 percent in two years, and he's done it by taking a tough stand with the union. What's your version of what's been happening in your state the last two years? It, it seems like the workers are being attacked. It seems more like a class war to the, to the folks that live in New Jersey. There's underfunding of our schools going on. There's underfunding of programs throughout our state. There's been cutbacks on workers. Uh, we had a huge blizzard at, right after Christmas, 
and it was a tough go in New Jersey trying to get the roads clear because there had been so many layoffs and, and furloughed employees throughout the state that we didn't even have enough workers to get the job done. And I think it's, it's just, as we go forward, we're going to see taxes going up and it's going to be harder for working families. Here's one of the discussions that you'll see, typical, um, Fox and Friends, uh, talking about how tough Christy is and how he's taking on the tough fights. Take a look. And one of the things that you spearheaded was really taking on the unions. Now other states, other governors are doing the same thing. I'm thinking of Governor Kasich, newly elected in Ohio, the new governor of Wisconsin. Even Jerry Brown, a liberal in California, yeah. is talking about making spending cuts and the unions. Yep. What was it about you that said, I have to do this? I think it's the issue, Gretchen. I don't think it's me. I mean, I think it's the issue. And I think they just needed some state to come forward and start. This is a group of people who are living in the last decade. Um, they're not living in today and the challenges that people face. They're saying things like, you can't cut our pensions, you can't cut our benefits, you can't affect our salaries. Everybody in New Jersey has had their salaries affected. Everyone's paying more for their health benefits. Right. Now, Fran, you, you represent exactly those workers and you work with the union. That's exactly one of the kind of unions he's talking about. Are you living in the last decade? I believe we are. Uh, our taxes aren't going down, they're going up. Our cost of living... Uh, our, our uh, food, everything that you pay for is going up. And to expect the workers to have to give up their wages and, and their, their benefits and their, their retirement security, is it's just not fair. So you may be, but perhaps not in the sense that he means. I mean, his point is, you're just not being realistic. We're in tough times. Everybody's got to give something. And even the private sector unions are balking at some of what the public sector unions are demanding. Yeah, that's true. But in New Jersey, we're, de we're dealing with privatization right now. They're threatening our jobs. Uh, they want to bring in private companies to do the job cheaper. We're in negotiations right this minute. They're, they're talking about cutting wages 40% for the turnpike workers. And to say that that's fair, that's, that's a bit extreme. We've paid our money into the pension system every single payday. The state hasn't put in money in the better part of 13 years. I don't think it's wrong to expect retirement security when you've made the investment and the state hasn't kept their end of the bargain. What's your take, Ed? Well, look, this comes after 30 years of wage suppression in the private sector. Uh, you, we've exported millions of jobs. Jersey and New York region have lost millions of manufacturing industrial jobs. So that first they shrink the, the private sector wage bill, and then they turn around to public sector workers and say, oh, you're the rich people. This is the old Lenny Bruce line. First they break your legs and then they laugh at you because you can't dance. Mm -hmm. uh, public sector workers are now going through what they put the United Auto Workers, United Steel Workers, the rubber workers through in, in the last 25 years. They claim that they had the Cadillac benefits and everything else. In the process, they've destroyed whole cultures in this country of productive work. And now they're going to turn around to public sector workers who provide essential services. You know, how did the teachers become the bad guys in this thing? Well, I think it's got more to do with a political agenda, an ideological view, than it does with actual economics. The well, truth of the matter out. is I mean, because the, the teachers, unions are more teachers' unions are more committed to education reform than anybody in the press is going to give them credit for. But beyond that, I mean, if you talk today about public sector workers, I did the other day on a, on a tweet on Twitter, and if you don't follow me on Twitter, you can. Um, and I got a response back, yeah, but what about private workers? We're the ones that pay their salaries. Well, part, of, part of it reflects a weakness in the private sector unions. You know, in terms of union density in this country, after this last 30 years of losing our manufacturing base, we're at the exact percentage of organized workers in the private sector that we were in 1901. Mm -hmm. And what they're really doing, in my view, they're going after the, the largest, most important component of the organized working class right now, which is in the public sector. It's the one place where if you play by the rules and you, you go get your education, you come to work each morning, you get out of bed, you do your job, that you can advance, get to the point where you have a pension which is your deferred wages put aside for you, and you can have a decent life at the end of a working life. And when governors like Christie and others start going after that wholesale, basically what they're saying is we're going to destroy a middle-class standard that workers have achieved in this country through a century of organizing and hard work. That's what's at stake here. Talk about some of the organizing that people like your members have done, or why is it important? Well, they're middle-class families. They're taxpayers. They're citizens of our state. They're trying to be productive. They're trying to care for their children. 
and we need to continue to be able to provide that. We're, we're living in a society right now where unemployment is 9.4% 9 9 nationally, 9.2% in New Jersey. And a lot of people think it's more like 16% if you really include cities. everybody that should be included around this country. Absolutely. You go into the cities and it's definitely higher. We're, the Turnpike made $169 million last year. They project they're going to make $200 million this year. They reported in December that they saved $300 million on contracts that came in under budget and early. Does that sound like a company that's doing badly? Mm -hmm. they, they are planning on raising their tolls 50% in 2012, regardless of whether we take a pay cut or not. That, that money has already been dedicated. They're going to use it for uh, the capital budget, the, con the construction program. And they had set aside one and a quarter billion out of that for the ARC tunnel, which has been canceled. Yeah. So that's what about out. the history of privatization? You mentioned it a little bit, front at the beginning. But New Jersey has certainly, and other states too, have experimented with privatization. Um, the motor vehicle department, certainly prisons. Pick one. Talk about the experience. Well, I mean, in general, with, with privatization, what you're going to do is people in the private sector are not going to take on the burdens of society. So when the government offers to privatize, say, highways, what I, if I'm a private sector business person, I'm going to look at, well, what's the piece of it that I can make money off of? <laughs> and we'll leave the rest to the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So you're actually, in some ways, maybe promoting inefficiencies. But th there is a fundamental question here. And, and you take something like highways, bridges, infrastructure in general, including your education infrastructure, money has to come from somewhere. And I think that what really needs to happen here is there needs to be a really broad discussion, which includes the unions and collective bargaining, about how we're going to restructure the funding mechanisms so that we can go forward. The more infrastructure you build, the more it eats away at your tax dollar. And that's part of the, the tension But it isn't a zero-sum game here. I mean, the way that Christie talks and the way that most of the people, that, or a lot of people that talk to him talk, you would think it's a zero-sum between the public sector workers and the private sector workers. Oh. When you take from one, you give to the other. Right. What about other sources of revenue? I mean, this is a guy who I think um, vetoed a bill that would have added a new tax for millionaires and up. Where else can some of this money come from, Fran? It should come from the millionaires. That, that would be the right thing to do. They, they're the ones that can most afford it. Our, our, our uh, poor and, and lower working class in New Jersey, they're actually paying more taxes than they were a year ago. And so there's a, it's imbalanced in New mm. Jersey. The people that can afford it should be paying. Is anything going to change? Um, I was very taken with what Daniel Hernandez, the intern that's credited with saving the life of Gabriel Giffords in Tucson, had to say at the memorial service in Arizona this week. Here's a clip. The people that are the heroes are people like Pam Simon, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, Gabe Zimmerman, who unfortunately we lost that day, Ron Barber, the first responders, and also people like Dr. Ree, who have done an amazing job at making sure that Gabby is okay and those who are injured are being treated to the best of our ability. First responders. Public workers, last time I looked, at least most of them. Um, what are you doing and what are union, the union movement doing generally to try to respond to some of these attacks? And do you think anything will change as people understand it better? Well, getting to come on your show is a big help because our message isn't really getting out there. We really don't seem to get a fair shake most days in the press. I think they've kind of jumped on this bandwagon of public employees are bad. There have been a lot of editorials in New Jersey press that have uh, actually promoted privatizing jobs. And I think we need to get our, our side of the story out there. I think when you're talking about things like privatization, you're talking about profit motives, and, and you're not talking about the public interest. And people who are first responders are, are under attack in New Jersey, police and fire, uh, their ability to support their families, lots of layoffs. And you're going to see crime rates going up. And it's going to be a very difficult time if we don't get this turned around. We've got about 30 seconds, Ed. Uh, you want more revenue? Employ the 20 million people or so that have lost their jobs or are underemployed right now, and you get more revenue. There are other solutions. The tax system has gotten regressive in the last couple of decades. Maybe we need to add some progressivity there and make it fair. Mm -hmm. If we're in crisis, which maybe we really are, not the result of the fault of public sector workers, but the collapse, collapse of the private sector, 
maybe everybody has to ante up and maybe we do have to go back to some of the tax structures that existed before the last 30 years. That are being certainly experimented with in other parts of the country. Absolutely. Illinois, and Texas example. gives proof. It's not public sector workers. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more uh, in the weeks and months to come. Ed Art, Fran Eret, thanks so much for coming in. You're watching Grid TV. There are more links and more information at our website. It's Dr. King Day on Monday, the holiday that celebrates the Nobel Peace Prize winner's birth and life. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't assassinated as Representative Gabriel Giffords almost was at a Congress on your corner or even on a civil rights march. He was assassinated in Memphis, where he was showing up to support the right of public employees to organize and strike. What have civil rights got to do with public workers' rights? To use President Obama's phrase in Tucson, perhaps we need to widen our circle of concern, as King did when it comes to civil rights. Dr. King didn't distinguish social rights from economic rights, surprising as that may seem to the commentators who've shrunk his story down for convenience sake. Like Eleanor Roosevelt and many of her contemporaries, King saw a linkage between legal rights being permitted, say, to see a quality doctor, attend a quality school, or live in a quality community, and economic rights, actually being able to make a living that permits you to do any of those things. King saw public workers as the first line of defense. That's why he went to Memphis, to stand by striking sanitation members of AFSCME, the public workers' union. In his view, they led the way in the fight for fair pay and benefits, and in the fight for dignity for those who shovel our snow and clean our streets. Daniel Hernandez, the intern for Gabriel Giffords, who's credited with saving her life, said something kind of king-like at Wednesday's memorial service, quote, we must reject the title of hero and reserve it for those who deserve it. And those who deserve it are the first responders and the public servants and the people who have made sure they have dedicated their lives to helping others. With exactly those workers under attack right now, Hernandez, the out gay son of an immigrant, was right on target. This stuck to King Day, we would all do well, perhaps, to join King and Hernandez and widen our circle of civil rights concern to include those who do the work that enables the rest of us to do ours clean and calm and safe. Thanks. That's it for today's program. You'll find everything you've seen at our website, grittv.org, and you can sign up there for our email list so we can stay in touch with you. Don't forget, you can follow me or Grit TV on Twitter and find us on Facebook. Post your videos and songs and comments there. You can contribute to the making of this program at our website. Keep those donations coming. It's thanks to you we're broadcasting commercial-free on Free Speech TV, Dish Network Channel 9415, Direct TV 348, and newly on Bridges TV. Thanks for watching.